Hi, Janet. How's it going? Hi, Ann. I'm great. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. You've, uh, you've been home for a while, not on the road. I have. I have. Um, you know, we work from home, but I usually work from home part time and travel part time. So yeah, I've been home a lot. And that can feel very different. You know, it was nice at first, but, um, and I love working from home. I love that we have that option, but I really miss being able to alternate my workspace. So usually at, at least once a week, if not more, I go to another place to work, either a lot of times the local library, but also like the local coffee shops. And what I love about it is it, the different environments. And so it's just the right amount of background noise. And um, like one of them, it's a little more, the light's a little bit lower and stuff, that's cool. But there's just so many choices and those are gone right now. It's my house. This is where I work now. Right, so you really have sort of one environment, one sensory environment, and we know that a lot of children are going to be in that same situation as they are coming back to programs. Programs are reopening, opening more fully. We're seeing a lot of changes in how the environments are being set up, and in one way that's happening is through that sensory environment that you're talking about is that nice, calming, relaxing space that, uh, that you enjoy going to that coffee shop and one of the concerns that we hear coming up often is that sensory tables, such as a sand table or a water table, are needing to be removed from classrooms and program spaces because of a concern around, and rightly so, about being able to keep everything sanitized so that we're really pre preventing the spread of COVID-19 as much as possible. But what we wanna do is talk about how we might be able to include sensory materials in the classroom so that children get that same sense of warmth and comfort from those sensory items that they're used to that you get from being in a coffee shop but in a way that we can keep things sanitized so you have some wonderful pictures to show us of some yes. different sensory ideas yeah let me share my screen and then we'll walk through uh, just a few of them can you see that okay yes that's great excellent so um one of our ideas that we talked about was instead of having the larger sensory tables, like the water tables that, you know, they were taking more individualized bins. So this bin um, could be used for a single child. And I still, I have no idea what the stuff is in there. But, um, do you have an idea what that might be? I get my first instinct is rice, but I'm just not quite sure. But it looks like it would have a nice texture to it. Yeah, it looks really great. And so I think that um, the important thing to remember for programs is what can you use in your sensory bins and being thoughtful about what do we have to toss out? Like how often can we use it? And we'll talk a little bit about that too. But so something that's safe to put in the bins, but it's designed for the child. And then the toys that go in there can be easily sanitized. And we'll talk about how to um, maybe prolong the use of whatever the other substance is. So this is another idea for um, individual use of sensory table uh, activities. So it's a smaller container, and then you have a, a few other containers that the child can choose to add to their own sensory. So it's kind of like almost mixing a recipe of sensory items for them to use. And I love this idea too, because you could think about almost like you said, having this recipe of a sensory bin where perhaps you have a larger container of the rocks or the beads that you keep in your closet. And then maybe at the beginning of the week, you allow children to choose some things that they might be able to scoop or you could scoop that as the provider with some gloves on, scoop with that scoop, that measuring cup into that child's individual sensory bin. And as you can see, everything here is something that can be easily sanitized. Even though those are pebbles, rocks, beads, little toys, all of those are things that we would be able to sanitize so that when a child is done using them, whether it's the end of the day after a couple of days or the week, you could easily make sure that those go into that yuck bucket and that you are sanitizing those so that they're ready for the next time. Right, yeah, and with these small little individualized sized packaging, they can have several things that they can then mix into their little bit larger things. So I think this is a, I think this will work really well for some of the programs. 
Uh, speaking of individualizing, um, tell us about this. Yeah, so this was um, a rice bin that we made at my house. My daughter, Caroline, is four. And while we've been quarantining at home, uh, we created rice, rainbow rice with some food coloring, but then she wanted to add some things in there. And so we took some rocks from our driveway, mulch from our garden bed, and some shells that we had collected from previous trips to the beach and put glue and glitter on them because she's a glitter girl. And so these were things that she could put into her rice bin. And that rice bin is in a plastic container with a cap that can go on top of it. So if you did something like this in your program, you could easily sanitize that bin. Again, this would be for an individual. And you would have to figure out, you know, how, how long are we gonna keep something like that rice? And again, always remembering what your own regulations are about using food products in your sensory uh, tables. Um, but how long are we gonna keep that rice is that something that we might be able to keep for several weeks and it stay good and maybe it's the, um, again, just for that one particular child, it stays in their cubby and then we're sanitizing the outside of it. Yeah, I like that. So we, of course, wanted to show you pictures of children using sensory bins because how cute is that? And one of the reasons I chose this picture besides the um, amazing little girl is they're positioning on the floor. So you and I've been in a lot of programs and the space availability varies just everywhere we go. And I like the way they were able to find places on the floor to um, give a completely different kind of sensory experience for children who might be using this bin on the floor. And so encouraging providers to look at your whole space and think about those kids who really need the sensory experiences and where does it make sense to do it? Because some kids might need this in a quieter part of the classroom. Some kids aren't gonna care. This could be right in the middle of the busiest part and they'll be okay with it, but we don't have to just be on the table with it. And I think the other thing to look at is with these bins in this picture, you can see this is how they would traditionally be used. But I think it's important to think about spacing and um, kids because you and I both know if I have a truck in my sensory bin, I'm going to reach over and drive it into my peers bin because they're so close. So thinking about, again, how do you set these up and where do you set them up to make sure there's space between um, so the kids aren't reaching in and out of each other's um, buckets. And it's something that they're just going to have to reinforce. And I know there are different levels of concern with the providers I've been talking to some of them are saying we just have to really clean everything after kids use it and others are saying oh, we have a little bit more leeway we're cleaning a lot more often but it depends on what the item is and how it's used i think the water table was one of the big ones and then also um, another one that i've heard about i will talk about that in a minute the play-doh i want to talk about play-doh but first let's talk about this so um this is a sensory bin i created with stuff i have in my home which is bird seed that the squirrels love and you can see the sunflower seeds and the toys are in here. Easy for kids to use. You can use scoops, cups, whatever. And then when it's time for cleanup, you can help the kids learn to put the toys in a yuck bucket. And this will reinforce some of, um, some of the cleanup routines you may have to add in for other areas of the classroom. And that way it doesn't take the toys out of circulation because they're hanging out in a container for these kids to use for sensory. And then a teacher can help them put that, the messy part, the rice or the sunflower seeds or the rocks or the leaves, whatever that substance is, into individualized packaged um, container. And then this bag can be sanitized. So sensory bags can be stored for the kids. Some places they're gonna, um, that I've talked to, they're gonna create uh, bins and bags like this and keeping kids cubbies. Other programs talked about keeping space in closets for this. So this is back to the Play-Doh thing. Um, I love this picture. Sam just really needs things to squeeze sometimes. And so this is his squeeze bag that's got some slimy kind of stuff in it. And this is a good way to, for those kids who need that kind of um, input to do your Play-Doh, your Floam and stuff like this. This one is intended to be squeezed inside the bag. But I think you can also um, create individualized bags of Floam, Play-Doh, those kinds of things that kids can take out. And again, it's just teaching them about how and where to use it. They put it back in their bag, 
put their bag wherever it the designated space to be cleaned and then they still get that sensory experience because we have so many kids that need that kind of um, input to uh, be successful in the classroom. Absolutely. If everybody has their own set of Play-Doh things, you know, the toys that you can use and the, and the actual containers, then we can still use it. We just use it in a different way. And I have another little um, squeeze bag that we made at my house. You can see there. This is called Moon Dough. It's made with cornstarch and hair conditioner. And just like the picture with Sam squeezing the gel, this is a different level of um, resistance that you can get to squeeze. So some children will need something that's a little bit harder to squeeze. And again, it's in its own individual bag that you could sanitize and again, label for one particular child. I love that idea. There's so many good ideas. So I think um, the important thing for us to remember is some kids need this. All kids need it at some level and some kids need it more. So how do you create opportunities for sensory play for all of the children? And then looking at those um, individuals who need it more, how do you create those individual sensory bins or containers for them? And then one of the things that we get pushed back on sometimes um, or just questions about really is what about the other kids? If this child has this all the time, what about the other kids when asked? And really, it's pretty easy with kids most of the time. You can say things like, this helps him keep his body calm. What helps you keep calm? Things like that. So a really simple answer, that's the truth, um, pretty much helps kids understand and they'll let it go. This is great. Thank you so much, Janet, for sharing those photos and hopefully helping all of the child care and youth development workers out how they can use sensory items even in a COVID world so that we're not, we're not saying no to sensory altogether, but we're finding a way to make it work even with the new sanitation guidelines that we're all following. Absolutely.